Section 11 of The Case Book of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. Story 11. The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. Sherlock Holmes had been bending for a long time over a low-power microscope. Now he straightened himself up and looked round at me in triumph. "'It is glue, Watson,' said he. "'Unquestionably it is glue. Have a look at these scattered objects in the field.' I stooped to the eyepiece and focused for my vision. "'Those hairs are threads from a tweed coat. The irregular grey masses are dust. There are epithelial scales on the left. Those brown blobs in the centre are undoubtedly glue.' Well, I said, laughing, I am prepared to take your word for it. Does anything depend upon it? It is a very fine demonstration, he answered. In the St. Pancras case, you may remember that a cap was found beside the dead policeman. The accused man denies that it is his. But he is a picture frame maker who habitually handles glue. Is it one of your cases? No. My friend Merivale of the Yard asked me to look into the case. Since I ran down that corner by the zinc and copper filings in the seam of his cuff, they have begun to realize the importance of the microscope. He looked impatiently at his watch. I had a new client calling, but he is overdue. By the way, Watson, you know something of racing? I ought to. I pay for it with about half of my wound pension. "'Then I'll make you my handy guide to the turf. "'What about Sir Robert Norberton? "'Does the name recall anything?' "'Well, I should say so. "'He lives at Shoscombe Old Place, "'and I know it well, "'for my summer quarters were down there once. "'Norberton nearly came within your province once. "'How was that?' "'It was when he horsewhipped Sam Brewer, "'the well-known Curzon Street moneylender, "'on Newmarket Heath. "'He nearly killed the man.' "'Ah, he sounds interesting. Does he often indulge in that way?' "'Well, he has the name of being a dangerous man. He is about the most daredevil rider in England, second in the Grand National a few years back. He is one of those men who have overshot their true generation. He should have been a buck in the days of the Regency, a boxer, an athlete, a plunger on the turf, a lover of fair ladies, and, by all account, so far down Queer Street that he may never find his way back again.' "'Capital, Watson. A thumbnail sketch. I seem to know the man. Now, can you give me some idea of Shoscombe Old Place?' "'Only that it is in the centre of Shoscombe Park, and that the famous Shoscombe Stud and Training Quarters are to be found there.' "'And the head trainer,' said Holmes, "'is John Mason. You need not look surprised at my knowledge, Watson, for this is a letter from him which I am unfolding. But let us have some more about Shoscombe. I seem to have struck a rich vein. There are the Shoscombe Spaniels, said I. You hear of them at every dog show. The most exclusive breed in England. They are the special pride of the lady of Shoscombe Old Place. Sir Robert Norberton's wife, I presume. Sir Robert has never married. Just as well, I think, considering his prospects. He lives with his widowed sister, Lady Beatrice Falder. You mean that she lives with him? "'No, no. The place belonged to her late husband, Sir James. Norberton has no claim on it at all. It is only a life interest and reverts to her husband's brother. And meantime, she draws the rents every year. And brother Robert, I suppose, spends the said rents?' "'That is about the size of it. He is a devil of a fellow and must lead her a most uneasy life. Yet I have heard that she is devoted to him. But what is amiss at Shoscombe? Ah, that is just what I want to know. And here, I expect, is the man who can tell us. The door had opened, and the page had shown in a tall, clean-shaven man with the firm, austere expression which is only seen upon those who have to control horses or boys. Mr. John Mason had many of both under his sway, and he looked equal to the task. He bowed with cold self-possession and seated himself upon the chair to which Holmes had waved him. "'You had my note, Mr. Holmes?' "'Yes, but it explained nothing. "'It was too delicate a thing for me to put the details on paper, "'and too complicated. "'It was only face to face I could do it. "'Well, we are at your disposal. First of all, Mr. Holmes, I think that my employer, Sir Robert, has gone mad.' 
Holmes raised his eyebrows. This is Baker Street, not Harley Street, said he. But why do you say so? Well, sir, when a man does one queer thing, or two queer things, there may be a meaning to it, but when everything he does is queer, then you begin to wonder. I believe Shoscombe Prince and the Derby have turned his brain. That is a colt you are running? The best in England, Mr. Holmes. I should know if anyone does. Now, I'll be plain with you, for I know you are a gentleman of honour, and that it won't go beyond the room. Sir Robert has got to win this Derby. He's up to the neck, and it's his last chance. Everything he could raise or borrow is on the horse, and at fine odds, too. You can get forties now, but it was nearer the hundred when he began to back him. But how is that if the horse is so good? The public don't know how good he is. Sir Robert has been too clever for the touts. He has the prince's half-brother out for spins. You can't tell him apart but there are two lengths in a furlong between them when it comes to a gallop. He thinks of nothing but the horse and the race. His whole life is on it. He is holding off the Jews till then. If the prince fails him, he is done. It seems a rather desperate gamble. But where does the madness come in? Well, first of all, you only have to look at him. I don't believe he sleeps at night. He is down at the stables at all hours. His eyes are wild. It has all been too much for his nerves. Then there is his conduct to Lady Beatrice. Ah, what is that? They have always been the best of friends. They had the same tastes, the two of them, and she loved the horses as much as he did. Every day at the same hour she would drive down to see them. And above all, she loved the prince. He would prick up his ears when he heard the wheels on the gravel, and he would trot out each morning to the carriage to get his lump of sugar. But that's all over now. Why? Well, she seems to have lost all interest in the horses. For a week now she has driven past the stables with never so much as good morning. You think there has been a quarrel? And a bitter, savage, spiteful quarrel at that. Why else would he give away a pet spaniel that she loved as if he were her child? He gave it away a few days ago to old Barnes, what keeps the green dragon three miles off at Crendel. That certainly did seem strange. Of course, with her weak heart and dropsy, one couldn't expect that she could get about with him. But he spent two hours every evening in her room. He might well do what he could, for she has been a rare good friend to him. But that's all over, too. He never goes near her, and she takes it to heart. She is brooding and sulky, and drinking, Mr. Holmes, drinking like a fish. Did she drink before this estrangement? Well, she took her glass. But now it is often a whole bottle of an evening. So Stevens, the butler, told me. It's all changed, Mr. Holmes, and there is something damned rotten about it. But then again, what is Master doing down at the old church crypt at night? And who is the man that meets him there? Holmes rubbed his hands. Go on, Mr. Mason. You get more and more interesting. It was the butler who saw him go. Twelve o'clock at night and raining hard. So next night I was up at the house, and sure enough, Master was off again. Stevens and I went after him, but it was jumpy work, for it would have been a bad job if he had seen us. He's a terrible man with his fists if he gets started, and no respecter of persons. So we were shy of getting too near, but we marked him down all right. It was the haunted crypt that he was making for, and there was a man waiting for him there. What is this haunted crypt? Well, sir, there is an old ruined chapel in the park. It is so old that nobody could fix its date, and under it there's a crypt, which has a bad name among us. It's a dark, damp, lonely place by day, but there are few in that county that would have the nerve to go near it at night. But the master's not afraid. He never feared anything in his life. But what is he doing there in the night time? Wait a bit, said Holmes. You say there is another man there. It must be one of your own stablemen, or someone from the house. Surely you have only to spot who it is and question him. It's no one I know. How can you say that? Because I have seen him, Mr. Holmes. It was on that second night. 
Sir Robert turned and passed us, me and Stevens, quaking in the bushes like two bunny rabbits, for there was a bit of moon that night, but we could hear the other moving about behind. We were not afraid of him, so we up when Mr. Robert was gone and pretended we were just having a walk-like in the moonlight, and so we came right on him as casual and innocent as you please. Hullo, mate, who may you be? says I. I guess he had not heard us coming, so he looked over his shoulder with a face as if he had seen the devil coming out of hell. He let out a yell, and away he went as hard as he could lick it in the darkness. He could run, I'll give him that. In a minute he was out of sight and hearing, and who he was or what he was we never found. But you saw him clearly in the moonlight. Yes, I would swear to his yellow face. A, a mean dog, I should say. What could he have in common with Sir Robert? Holmes sat for some time lost in thought. Who keeps Lady Beatrice Falder company? he asked at last. There is her maid, Carrie Evans. She has been with her this five years. And is no doubt devoted? Mr. Mason shuffled uncomfortably. She is devoted enough, he answered at last. But I won't say to whom. Ah, said Holmes. I can't tell tales out of school. I quite understand, Mr. Mason. Of course, the situation is clear enough. From Dr. Watson's description of Sir Robert, I can realize that no woman is safe from him. Don't you think the quarrel between brother and sister may lie there? Well, the scandal has been pretty clear for a long time. But she may not have seen it before. Let us suppose that she has suddenly found it out. She wants to get rid of the woman. Her brother will not permit it. The invalid, with her weak heart and inability to get about, has no means of enforcing her will. The hated maid is still tied to her. The lady refuses to speak, sulks, takes to drink. Sir Robert, in his anger, takes her pet spaniel away from her. Does not all this hang together? Well, it might do, so far as it goes. Exactly, as far as it goes. How would all that bear upon the visits by night to the old crypt? We can't fit that into our plot. No, sir, and there is something more that I can't fit in. Why should Sir Robert want to dig up a dead body? Holmes sat up abruptly. We only found it out yesterday, after I had written to you. Yesterday Sir Robert had gone to London, so Stevens and I went down to the crypt. It was all in order, sir, except that in one corner was a bit of a human body. You informed the police, I suppose? Our visitor smiled grimly. Well, sir, I think it would hardly interest them. It was just the head and a few bones of a mummy. It may have been a thousand years old, but it wasn't there before. That I'll swear, and so will Stevens. It had been stowed away in a corner and covered over with a board, but that corner had always been empty before. What did you do with it? Well, we just left it there. That was wise. You say Sir Robert was away yesterday. Has he returned? We expect him back today. When did Sir Robert give away his sister's dog? It was just a week ago today. The creature was howling outside the old well house, and Sir Robert was in one of his tantrums that morning. He caught it up, and I thought he would have killed it. Then he gave it to Sandy Bain, the jockey, and told him to take the dog to old Barnes at the Green Dragon, for he never wished to see it again. Holmes sat for some time in silent thought. He had lit the oldest and foulest of his pipes. I am not clear yet what you want me to do in this matter, Mr. Mason, he said at last. Can't you make it more definite? Perhaps this will make it more definite, Mr. Holmes, said our visitor. He took a paper from his pocket, and, unwrapping it carefully, he exposed a charred fragment of bone. Holmes examined it with interest. Where did you get it? There is a central heating furnace in the cellar under Lady Beatrice's room. It's been off for some time, but Sir Robert complained of cold and had it on again. Harvey runs it. He's one of my lads. This very morning he came to me with this, which he found raking out the cinders. He didn't like the look of it. Nor do I, said Holmes. What do you make of it, Watson? 
it was burned to a black cinder, but there could be no question as to its anatomical significance. It's the upper condyle of a human femur, said I. Exactly. Holmes had become very serious. When does this lad tend to the furnace? He makes it up every evening and then leaves it. Then anyone could visit it during the night? Yes, sir. Can you enter it from outside? There is one door from outside. There is another which leads up by a stair to the passage in which Lady Beatrice's room is situated. These are deep waters, Mr. Mason. Deep and rather dirty. You say that Sir Robert was not at home last night? No, sir. Then whoever was burning bones, it was not he. That's true, sir. What is the name of that inn you spoke of? The Green Dragon. Is there good fishing in that part of Berkshire? The honest trainer showed very clearly upon his face that he was convinced that yet another lunatic had come into his harassed life. "'Well, sir, I've heard there are trout in the mill stream and pike in the hall lake. "'That's good enough. "'Watson and I are famous fishermen, are we not, Watson? "'You may address us in future at the Green Dragon. "'We should reach it to-night. "'I need not say that we don't want to see you, Mr. Mason, "'but a note will reach us, "'and no doubt I could find you if I want you. "'When we have gone a little farther into the matter, "'I will let you have a considered opinion.' Thus it was that, on a bright May evening, Holmes and I found ourselves alone in a first-class carriage and bound for the little halt-on-demand station of Shoscombe. The rack above us was covered with a formidable litter of rods, reels, and baskets. On reaching our destination, a short drive took us to an old-fashioned tavern where a sporting host, Josiah Barnes, entered eagerly into our plans for the extirpation of the fish of the neighbourhood. "'What about the Hall Lake and the chance of a pike?' said Holmes. The face of the innkeeper clouded. "'That wouldn't do, sir. You might chance to find yourself in the lake before you were through.' "'How's that, then?' "'It's Sir Robert, sir. He's terrible jealous of touts. If you two strangers were as near his training quarters as that, he'd be after you as sure as fate. He ain't taken no chances, Sir Robert ain't.' "'I've heard he has a horse entered for the Derby. "'Yes, and a good colt, too. "'He carries all our money for the race "'and all Sir Robert's into the bargain. And "'By the way,' he looked at us with thoughtful eyes, "'I suppose you ain't on the turf yourselves?' "'No, indeed, just two weary Londoners "'who badly need some good Berkshire air. "'Well, you are in the right place for that. "'There's a deal of it lying about.' "'But mind what I have told you about Sir Robert. "'He's the sort that strikes first and speaks afterwards. "'Keep clear of the park.' "'Surely, Mr. Barnes, we certainly shall. "'By the way, that was a most beautiful spaniel "'that was whining in the hall. "'I should say it was. "'That was the real Shoscombe breed. "'There ain't a better in England.' "'I'm a dog fancier myself,' said Holmes. "'Now, if it is a fair question,' "'What would a prize dog like that cost?' "'More than I could pay, sir. "'It was Sir Robert himself who gave me this one. "'That's why I have to keep it on a lead. "'It would be off to the hall in a jiffy if I gave it its head.' "'We are getting some cards in our hand, Watson,' said Holmes, "'when the landlord had left us. "'It is not an easy one to play. "'But we may see our way in a day or two. "'By the way,' "'Sir Robert is still in London, I hear. "'We might perhaps enter the sacred domain to-night "'without fear of bodily assault. "'There are one or two points on which I should like reassurance. "'Have you any theory, Holmes? "'Only this, Watson, that something happened a week or so ago "'which has cut deep into the life of the Shoscombe household. "'What is that something? "'We can only guess at it from its effects.' They seem to be of a curiously mixed character, but that should surely help us. It is only the colourless, uneventful case which is hopeless. Let us consider our data. The brother no longer visits the beloved invalid sister. He gives away her favourite dog. Her dog, Watson, does that suggest nothing to you? Nothing but the brother's spite. 
Well, it might be so. Or, well, there is an alternative. Now, to continue our review of the situation from the time that the quarrel, if there is a quarrel, began. The lady keeps to her room, alters her habits, is not seen save when she drives out with her maid, refuses to stop at the stables to greet her favourite horse, and apparently takes to drink. That covers the case, does it not? Save for the business in the crypt. That is another line of thought. There are two, and I beg you will not tangle them. Line A, which concerns Lady Beatrice, has a vaguely sinister flavour, has it not? I can make nothing of it. Well, now, let us take up line B, which concerns Sir Robert. He is mad keen upon winning the Derby. He is in the hands of the Jews, and may at any moment be sold up and his racing stables seized by his creditors. He is a daring and desperate man. He derives his income from his sister. His sister's maid is his willing tool. So far we seem to be on fairly safe ground, do we not? But the crypt! Ah, yes, the crypt. Let us suppose, Watson, it is merely a scandalous supposition, a hypothesis put forward for argument's sake, that Sir Robert has done away with his sister. My dear Holmes, it is out of the question. Very possibly, Watson. Sir Robert is a man of an honourable stock. But you do occasionally find a carrion crow among the eagles. Let us for a moment argue upon this supposition. He could not fly the country until he had realised his fortune, and that fortune could only be realised by bringing off this coup with Shoscombe Prince. Therefore, he has still to stand his ground. To do this, he would have to dispose of the body of his victim, and he would also have to find a substitute who would impersonate her. With the maid as his confidant, that would not be impossible. The woman's body might be conveyed to the crypt, which is a place so seldom visited, and it might be secretly destroyed at night in the furnace, leaving behind it such evidence as we have already seen. What say you to that, Watson? Well, it is all possible if you grant the original monstrous supposition. I think that there is a small experiment which we may try tomorrow, Watson, in order to throw some light on the matter. Meanwhile, if we mean to keep up our characters, I suggest that we have our host in for a glass of his own wine, and hold some high converse upon eels and dace, which seems to be the straight road to his affections. We may chance to come upon some useful local gossip in the process. In the morning, Holmes discovered that we had come without our spoon-bait for Jack, which absolved us from fishing for the day. About eleven o'clock we started for a walk, and he obtained leave to take the black spaniel with us. "'This is the place,' said he, as we came to two high park gates with heraldic griffins towering above them. "'About midday, Mr. Barnes informs me, the old lady takes a drive, and the carriage must slow down while the gates are opened. When it comes through, and before it gathers speed, I want you, Watson, to stop the coachman with some question. Never mind me. I shall stand behind this holly bush and see what I can see. It was not a long vigil. Within a quarter of an hour we saw the big open yellow barouche coming down the long avenue, with two splendid high-stepping grey carriage horses in the shafts. Holmes crouched behind his bush with the dog. I stood unconcernedly swinging a cane in the roadway. A keeper ran out, and the gates swung open. The carriage had slowed to a walk, and I was able to get a good look at the occupants. A highly coloured young woman with flaxen hair and impudent eyes sat on the left. At her right was an elderly person with rounded back and a huddle of shawls about her face and shoulders, which proclaimed the invalid. When the horses reached the high road, I held up my hand with an authoritative gesture, and as the coachman pulled up, I inquired if Sir Robert was at Shoscombe Old Place. At the same moment, Holmes stepped out and released the spaniel. With a joyous cry, it dashed forward to the carriage and sprang upon the step. Then, in a moment, its eager greeting changed to furious rage, and it snapped at the black skirt above it. "'Drive on! Drive on!' shrieked a harsh voice. The coachman lashed the horses, and we were left standing in the roadway. 
Well, Watson, that's done it, said Holmes, as he fastened the lead to the neck of the excited spaniel. He thought it was his mistress, and he found it was a stranger. Dogs don't make mistakes. But it was the voice of a man, I cried. Exactly. We have added one card to our hand, Watson, but it needs careful playing all the same. My companion seemed to have no further plans for the day, and we did actually use our fishing tackle in the mill stream, with the result that we had a dish of trout for our supper. It was only after that meal that Holmes showed signs of renewed activity. Once more we found ourselves upon the same road as in the morning, which led us to the park gates. A tall, dark figure was awaiting us there, who proved to be our London acquaintance, Mr. John Mason, the trainer. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' said he. "'I got your note, Mr. Holmes. Sir Robert has not returned yet, but I hear that he is expected to-night.' "'How far is this crypt from the house?' asked Holmes. "'A good quarter of a mile. Then I think we can disregard him altogether.' "'I can't afford to do that, Mr. Holmes. The moment he arrives, he will want to see me to get the latest news of Shoscombe Prince.' "'I see.' "'In that case, we must work without you, Mr. Mason. "'You can show us the crypt and then leave us.' "'It was pitch dark and without a moon, "'but Mason led us over the grasslands "'until a dark mass loomed up in front of us "'which proved to be the ancient chapel. "'We entered the broken gap which was once the porch, "'and our guide, stumbling among heaps of loose masonry, "'picked his way to the corner of the building, "'where a steep stair led down into the crypt. "'Striking a match,' He illuminated the melancholy place, dismal and evil spelling, with ancient crumbling walls of rough-hewn stone and piles of coffins, some of lead and some of stone, extending upon one side right up to the arched and groined roof which lost itself in the shadows above our heads. Holmes had lit his lantern, which shot a tiny tunnel of vivid yellow light upon the mournful scene. Its rays were reflected back from the coffin plates, many of them adorned with the griffin and coronet of this old family, which carried its honours even to the gate of death. You spoke of some bones, Mr. Mason. Could you show them before you go? They are here in this corner. The trainer strode across, and then stood in silent surprise as our light was turned upon the place. They are gone, said he. So I expected, said Holmes, chuckling. I fancy the ashes of them might even now be found in that oven which has already consumed a part. But why in the world would any one want to burn the bones of a man who has been dead for a thousand years? asked John Mason. That is what we are here to find out, said Holmes. It may mean a long search, and we need not detain you. I fancy that we shall get our solution before morning. When John Mason had left us, Holmes set to work making a very careful examination of the graves, ranging from a very ancient one which appeared to be Saxon in the centre, through a long line of Norman Hugos and Odos, until we reached the Sir William and Sir Dennis Falder of the eighteenth century. It was an hour or more before Holmes came to a leaden coffin standing on end before the entrance to the vault. I heard his little cry of satisfaction, and was aware from his hurried but purposeful movements that he had reached a goal. With his lens he was eagerly examining the edges of the heavy lid. Then he drew from his pocket a short jemmy, a box-opener, which he thrust into a chink, levering back the whole front, which seemed to be secured by only a couple of clamps. There was a rending, tearing sound as it gave way, but it had hardly hinged back and partly revealed the contents before we had an unforeseen interruption. Someone was walking in the chapel above. It was the firm, rapid step of one who came with a definite purpose and knew well the ground upon which he walked. A light streamed down the stairs, and an instant later the man who bore it was framed in the Gothic archway. He was a terrible figure, huge in stature and fierce in manner. A large stable lantern, which he held in front of him, shone upwards upon a strong, heavily moustached face and angry eyes, which glared round him into every recess of the vault, finally fixing themselves with a deadly stare upon my companion and myself. "'Who the devil are you?' he thundered. "'And what are you doing upon my property?' 
Then, as Holmes returned no answer, he took a couple of steps forward and raised a heavy stick which he carried. "'Do you hear me?' he cried. "'Who are you? What are you doing here?' His cudgel quivered in the air. But instead of shrinking, Holmes advanced to meet him. "'I also have a question to ask you, Sir Robert,' he said in his sternest tone. "'Who is this, and what is it doing here?' He turned and tore open the coffin lid behind him. In the glare of the lantern I saw a body swathed in a sheet from head to foot, with dreadful witch-like features, all nose and chin, projecting at one end, the dim glazed eyes staring from a discoloured and crumbling face. The baronet had staggered back with a cry, and supported himself against a stone sarcophagus. "'How came you to know of this?' he cried, and then, with some return of his truculent manner, "'What business is it of yours?' "'My name is Sherlock Holmes,' said my companion. "'Possibly it is familiar to you. "'In any case, my business is that of every other good citizen, "'to uphold the law. "'It seems to me that you have much to answer for.' "'Sir Robert glared for a moment, "'but Holmes's quiet voice and cool, assured manner had their effect. "'For God, Mr. Holmes, it's all right,' said he. "'Appearances are against me, I'll admit, "'but I could act no otherwise.' "'I should be happy to think so, but I fear your explanations must be for the police.' Sir Robert shrugged his broad shoulders. "'Well, if it must be, it must. Come up to the house, and you can judge for yourself how the matter stands.' A quarter of an hour later we found ourselves in what I judge from the lines of polished barrels behind glass covers to be the gun-room of the old house. It was comfortably furnished, and here Sir Robert left us for a few moments.' When he returned, he had two companions with him. The one, the florid young woman, whom we had seen in the carriage. The other, a small, rat-faced man with a disagreeably furtive manner. These two wore an appearance of utter bewilderment, which showed that the baronet had not yet had time to explain to them the turn events had taken. "'There,' said Sir Robert, with a wave of his hand, "'are Mr. and Mrs. Norlet. Mrs. Norlet, under her maiden name of Evans,' has for some years been my sister's confidential maid. I have brought them here because I feel that my best course is to explain the true position to you, and they are the two people upon earth who can substantiate what I say. "'Is this necessary, Sir Robert? Have you thought what you are doing?' cried the woman. "'As to me, I entirely disclaim all responsibility,' said her husband. Sir Robert gave him a glance of contempt. "'I will take all responsibility,' said he. "'Now, Mr. Holmes, listen to a plain statement of the facts. "'You have clearly gone pretty deeply into my affairs, "'or I should not have found you where I did. "'Therefore you know already, in all probability, "'that I am running a dark horse for the Derby, "'and that everything depends upon my success. "'If I win, all is easy. "'If I lose, well, I dare not think of that. "'I understand the position,' said Holmes. "'I am dependent upon my sister, Lady Beatrice, for everything. "'But it is well known that her interest in the estate is for her own life only. "'For myself, I am deeply in the hands of the Jews. "'I have always known that if my sister were to die, "'my creditors would be on to my estate like a flock of vultures. "'Everything would be seized. "'My stables, my horses, everything. "'Well, Mr. Holmes,' "'My sister did die just a week ago. "'And you told no one. "'What could I do? "'Absolute ruin faced me. "'If I could stave things off for three weeks, all would be well. "'Her maid's husband, this man here, is an actor. "'It came into our heads, it came into my head, "'that he could, for that short period, personate my sister. "'It was but a case of appearing daily in the carriage, "'for no one need enter her room save a maid.' It was not difficult to arrange. My sister died of the dropsy which had long afflicted her. That will be for a coroner to decide. Her doctor would certify that for months her symptoms have threatened such an end. Well, what did you do? The body could not remain there. On the first night, Norlet and I carried it out to the old well-house, which is now never used. 
We were followed, however, by her pet spaniel, which yapped continually at the door, so I felt some safer place was needed. I got rid of the spaniel, and we carried the body to the crypt of the church. There was no indignity or irreverence, Mr. Holmes. I do not feel that I have wronged the dead. Your conduct seems to me inexcusable, Sir Robert. The baronet shook his head impatiently. It is easy to preach, said he. Perhaps you would have felt differently if you had been in my position. One cannot see all one's hopes and all one's plans shattered at the last moment and make no effort to save them. It seemed to me that it would be no unworthy resting place if we put her for the time in one of the coffins of her husband's ancestors, lying in what is still consecrated ground. We opened such a coffin, removed the contents, and placed her as you have seen her. As to the old relics which we took out, we could not leave them on the floor of the crypt. Norlet and I removed them, and he descended at night and burned them in the central furnace. There is my story, Mr. Holmes, though how you forced my hand so that I have to tell it is more than I can say. Holmes sat for some time lost in thought. There is one flaw in your narrative, Sir Robert, he said at last. Your bets on the race, and therefore your hopes for the future, would hold good even if your creditors seized your estate. The horse would be part of the estate. What do they care for my bets? As likely as not, they would not run him at all. My chief creditor is, unhappily, my most bitter enemy, a rascally fellow, Sam Brewer, whom I was once compelled to horsewhip on Newmarket Heath. Do you suppose that he would try to save me? Well, Sir Robert, said Holmes, rising, this matter must, of course, be referred to the police. It was my duty to bring the facts to light, and there I must leave it. As to the morality or decency of your conduct, it is not for me to express an opinion. It is nearly midnight, Watson, and I think we may make our way back to our humble abode. It is generally known, now, that this singular episode ended upon a happier note than Sir Robert's actions deserved. Shoscombe Prince did win the derby, the sporting owner did net eighty thousand pounds in bets, and the creditors did hold their hand until the race was over, when they were paid in full, and enough was left to re-establish Sir Robert in a fair position in life. Both police and coroner took a lenient view of the transaction, and beyond a mild censure for the delay in registering the lady's decease, the lucky owner got away scatheless from this strange incident in a career which has now outlived its shadows and promises to end in an honoured old age. End of the Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place Section 12 of The Case Book of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. Story 12. The Adventure of the Retired Color Man. Sherlock Holmes was in a melancholy and philosophic mood that morning. His alert practical nature was subject to such reactions. Did you see him? he asked. You mean the old fellow who has just gone out? Precisely. Yes, I met him at the door. What did you think of him? A pathetic, futile, broken creature. Exactly, Watson, pathetic and futile. But is not all life pathetic and futile? Is not his story a microcosm of the whole? We reach, we grasp, and what is left in our hands at the end? A shadow, or worse than a shadow, misery. Is he one of your clients? Well, I suppose I may call him so. He has been sent on by the yard. Just as medical men occasionally send their incurables to a quack, they argue that they can do nothing more, and that whatever happens, the patient can be no worse than he is. What is the matter? Holmes took a rather soiled card from the table. Josiah Amberley. He says he was junior partner of Brickfall and Amberley, who are manufacturers of artistic materials. You will see their names upon paint boxes. He made his little pile, retired from business at the age of sixty-one, bought a house in Lewisham, and settled down to rest 
after a life of ceaseless grind. One would think his future was tolerably assured. Yes, indeed. Holmes glanced over some notes which he had scribbled upon the back of an envelope. Retired in 1896, Watson. Early in 1897 he married a woman twenty years younger than himself, a good-looking woman, too, if the photograph does not flatter. A competence, a wife, leisure. It seemed a straight road which lay before him. And yet within two years he is, as you have seen, as broken and miserable a creature as crawls beneath the sun. But what has happened? The old story, Watson, a treacherous friend and a fickle wife. It would appear that Amberley has one hobby in life, and it is chess. Not far from him at Lewisham there lives a young doctor who is also a chess player. I have noted his name as Dr. Ray Ernest. Ernest was frequently in the house, and an intimacy between him and Mrs. Amberley was a natural sequence, for you must admit that our unfortunate client has few outward graces, whatever his inner virtues may be. The couple went off together last week, destination untraced. What is more, the faithless spouse carried off the old man's deed-box as her personal luggage, with a good part of his life's savings within. Can we find the lady? Can we save the money? A commonplace problem, so far as it has developed, and yet a vital one for Josiah Amberley. What would you do about it? Well, the immediate question, my dear Watson, happens to be, what will you do, if you will be good enough to understudy me? You know that I am preoccupied with this case of the two Coptic patriarchs which should come to a head today. I really have not time to go out to Lewisham, and yet evidence taken on the spot has a special value. The old fellow was quite insistent that I should go, but I explained my difficulty. He is prepared to meet a representative. By all means, I answered. I confess I don't see that I can be of much service, but I am willing to do my best. And so it was, that on a summer afternoon I set forth to Lewisham, little dreaming that within a week the affair in which I was engaging would be the eager debate of all England. It was late that evening before I returned to Baker Street and gave an account of my mission. Holmes lay with his gaunt figure stretched in his deep chair, his pipe curling forth slow wreaths of acrid tobacco, while his eyelids drooped over his eyes so lazily that he might almost have been asleep were it not that at any halt or questionable passage of my narrative they half lifted and two grey eyes as bright and keen as rapiers transfixed me with their searching glance the haven is the name of mr josiah amberley's house i explained i think it would interest you holmes it is like some penurious patrician who has sunk into the company of his inferiors you know that particular quarter, the monotonous brick streets, the weary suburban highways. Right in the middle of them, a little island of ancient culture and comfort, lies this old home, surrounded by a high sun-baked wall mottled with lichens and topped with moss, the sort of wall cut out the poetry, Watson, said Holmes severely. I note that it was a high brick wall. Exactly. I should not have known which was the haven, had I not asked a lounger who was smoking in the street. I have a reason for mentioning him. He was a tall, dark, heavily moustached, rather military-looking man. He nodded in answer to my inquiry, and gave me a curiously questioning glance, which came back to my memory a little later. I had hardly entered the gateway before I saw Mr. Amberley coming down the drive. I only had a glimpse of him this morning— and he certainly gave me the impression of a strange creature, but when I saw him in full light, his appearance was even more abnormal. "'I have, of course, studied it, and yet I should be interested to have your impression,' said Holmes. "'He seemed to me like a man who was literally bowed down by care. His back was curved as though he carried a heavy burden. Yet he was not the weakling that I had at first imagined, for his shoulders and chest have the framework of a giant, though his figure tapers away into a pair of spindled legs. Left shoe wrinkled, right one smooth. I did not observe that. No, you wouldn't. I spotted his artificial limb. But proceed. 
I was struck by the snaky locks of grizzled hair which curled from under his old straw hat, and his face with its fierce, eager expression and the deeply lined features. Very good, Watson. What did he say? He began pouring out the story of his grievances. We walked down the drive together, and, of course, I took a good look round. I have never seen a worse-kept place. The garden was all running to seed, giving me an impression of wild neglect, in which the plants had been allowed to find the way of nature rather than of art. How any decent woman could have tolerated such a state of things I don't know. The house, too, was slatternly to the last degree, but the poor man seemed himself to be aware of it and to be trying to remedy it, for a great pot of green paint stood in the centre of the hall, and he was carrying a thick brush in his left hand. He had been working on the woodwork. He took me into his dingy sanctum, and we had a long chat. Of course, he was disappointed that you had not come yourself. I hardly expected, he said, that so humble an individual as myself, especially after my heavy financial loss, could obtain the complete attention of so famous a man as Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I assured him that the financial question did not arise. No, of course it is art for art's sake with him, said he. But even on the artistic side of crime, he might have found something here to study. And human nature, Dr. Watson, the black ingratitude of it all. When did I ever refuse one of her requests? Was ever a woman so pampered? And that young man, he might have been my own son. He had the run of my house. And yet, see how they have treated me. Oh, Dr. Watson, it is a dreadful, dreadful world. That was the burden of his song for an hour or more. He had, it seems, no suspicion of an intrigue. They lived alone, save for a woman who comes in by the day and leaves every evening at six. On that particular evening, old Amberley, wishing to give his wife a treat, had taken two upper circle seats at the Haymarket Theatre. At the last moment she had complained of a headache and had refused to go. He had gone alone. There seemed to be no doubt about the fact for he produced the unused ticket which he had taken for his wife. "'That is remarkable, most remarkable,' said Holmes, whose interest in the case seemed to be rising. "'Pray continue, Watson. I find your narrative most arresting. Did you personally examine this ticket? You did not, perchance, take the number?' "'It so happens that I did,' I answered with some pride. "'It chanced to be my old school number, thirty-one, and so it stuck in my head.' "'Excellent, Watson. His seat, then, was either thirty or thirty-two. "'Quite so,' I answered, with some mystification. "'And on B row. "'That is most satisfactory. What else did he tell you?' "'He showed me his strong room, as he called it. "'It is really a strong room, like a bank with iron door and shutter, "'burglar-proof, as he claimed. However, the woman seems to have had a duplicate key, and between them they had carried off some seven thousand pounds worth of cash and securities. Securities? How could they dispose of those? He said that he had given the police a list, and that he hoped they would be unsaleable. He had got back from the theatre about midnight, and found the place plundered, the door and window open, and the fugitives gone. There was no letter or message, nor has he heard a word since. He at once gave the alarm to the police. Holmes brooded for some minutes. You say he was painting. What was he painting? Well, he was painting the passage, but he had already painted the door and woodwork of this room I spoke of. Does it not strike you as a strange occupation in the circumstances? One must do something to ease an aching heart. That was his own explanation. It was eccentric, no doubt, but he is clearly an eccentric man. He tore up one of his wife's photographs in my presence, tore it up furiously in a tempest of passion. I never wish to see her damned face again, he shrieked. Anything more, Watson? Yes, one thing which struck me more than anything else. I had driven to the Blackheath station and had caught my train there, when, just as it was starting, I saw a man dart into the carriage next to my own. You know that I have a quick eye for faces, Holmes. It was undoubtedly the tall, dark man whom I had addressed in the street. 
I saw him once more at London Bridge, and then I lost him in the crowd. But I am convinced that he was following me. No doubt, no doubt, said Holmes. A tall, dark, heavily moustached man, you say, with grey tinted sunglasses? Holmes, you are a wizard, I did not say so. But he had grey tinted sunglasses. And a Masonic tie pin? Holmes! Quite simple, my dear Watson. But let us get down to what is practical. I must admit to you that the case, which seemed to me to be so absurdly simple as to be hardly worth my notice, is rapidly assuming a very different aspect. It is true that though in your mission you have missed everything of importance, yet even those things which have obtruded themselves upon your notice give rise to serious thought. What have I missed? Don't be hurt, my dear fellow. You know that I am quite impersonal. No one else would have done better. Some possibly not so well. But clearly you have missed some vital points. What is the opinion of the neighbors about this man Amberley and his wife? That surely is of importance. What of Dr. Ernest? Was he the gay Lothario one would expect? With your natural advantages, Watson, every lady is your helper and accomplice. What about the girl at the post office, or the wife of the greengrocer? I can picture you whispering soft nothings with the young lady at the blue anchor, and receiving hard somethings in exchange. All this you have left undone. It can still be done. It has been done. Thanks to the telephone and the help of the yard, I can usually get my essentials without leaving this room. As a matter of fact, my information confirms the man's story. He has the local repute of being a miser as well as a harsh and exacting husband. That he had a large sum of money in that strong room of his is certain. So also is it that young Dr. Ernest, an unmarried man, played chess with Amberley, and probably played the fool with his wife. All this seems plain sailing, and one would think that there was no more to be said. And yet, and yet, where lies the difficulty? In my imagination, perhaps. Well, leave it there, Watson. Let us escape from this weary workaday world by the side door of music. Karina sings tonight at the Albert Hall, and we still have time to dress, dine, and enjoy. In the morning I was up betimes, but some toast crumbs and two empty eggshells told me that my companion was earlier still. I found a scribbled note upon the table. Dear Watson, there are one or two points of contact which I should wish to establish with Mr. Josiah Amberley. When I have done so we can dismiss the case, or not. I would only ask you to be on hand about three o'clock, as I conceive it possible that I may want you. S. H. I saw nothing of Holmes all day, but at the hour named he returned, grave, preoccupied, and aloof. At such times it was wiser to leave him to himself. Has Amberley been here yet? No. Ah, I am expecting him. He was not disappointed, for presently the old fellow arrived with a very worried and puzzled expression upon his austere face. "'I have had a telegram, Mr. Holmes. I can make nothing of it.' He handed it over, and Holmes read it aloud. "'Come at once without fail. Can give you information as to your recent loss. Elman, the vicarage.' "'Dispatched at two ten from Little Turlington,' said Holmes. "'Little Turlington is in Essex, I believe, not far from Printon. "'Well, of course, you will start at once. "'This is evidently from a responsible person, the vicar of the place. "'Where is my Crockford? "'Yes, here we have him. "'J. C. Elman, M. A., living of Mossmoor, come Little Purlington. "'Look up the trains, Watson. "'There's one at 5.20 from Liverpool Street. "'Excellent. "'You had best go with him, Watson. "'He may need help or advice. "'Clearly we have come to a crisis in this affair.' but our client seemed by no means eager to start. "'It's perfectly absurd, Mr. Holmes,' he said. "'What can this man possibly know of what has occurred? It is a waste of time and money.' "'He would not have telegraphed to you if he did not know something. Wire at once that you are coming.' "'I don't think I shall go.' Holmes assumed his sternest aspect. 
it would make the worst possible impression both on the police and upon myself mr amberley if when so obvious a clue arose you should refuse to follow it up we should feel that you were not really in earnest in this investigation our client seemed horrified at the suggestion why of course i shall go if you look at it that way said he on the face of it it seems absurd to suppose that this parson knows anything but if you think i do think said holmes with emphasis and so we were launched upon our journey holmes took me aside before we left the room and gave me one word of counsel which showed that he considered the matter to be of importance whatever you do see that he really does go said he should he break away or return get to the nearest telephone exchange and send the single word bolted i will arrange here that it shall reach me wherever i am little purlington is not an easy place to reach for it is on a branch line my remembrance of the journey is not a pleasant one for the weather was hot the train slow and my companion sullen and silent hardly talking at all save to make an occasional sardonic remark as to the futility of our proceedings when we at last reached the little station it was a two-mile drive before we came to the vicarage where a big solemn rather pompous clergyman received us in his study our telegram lay before him well gentlemen he asked what can i do for you we came i explained in answer to your wire my wire i sent no wire i mean the wire which you sent to mr josiah amberley about his wife and his money if this is a joke sir it is a very questionable one said the vicar angrily i have never heard of the gentleman you name and i have not sent a wire to any one our client and i looked at each other in amazement perhaps there is some mistake said i are there perhaps two vicarages here is the wire itself signed elman and dated from the vicarage there is only one vicarage sir and only one vicar and this wire is a scandalous forgery the origin of which shall certainly be investigated by the police meanwhile i can see no possible object in prolonging this interview so mr amberley and i found ourselves on the roadside in what seemed to me to be the most primitive village in england we made for the telegraph office but it was already closed there was a telephone however in the little railway arms and by it i got in touch with holmes who shared in our amazement at the result of our journey most singular said the distant voice most remarkable i much fear my dear watson that there is no return train to-night i have unwittingly condemned you to the horrors of a country inn however there is always nature watson nature and josiah amberley you can be in close commune with both i heard his dry chuckle as he turned away it was soon apparent to me that my companion's reputation as a miser was not undeserved he had grumbled at the expense of the journey had insisted upon travelling third class and was now clamorous in his objections to the hotel bill next morning when we did at last arrive in london it was hard to say which of us was in the worst humour you had best take baker street as we pass said i mr holmes may have some fresh instructions if they are not worth more than the last ones they are not of much use said amberley with a malevolent scowl none the less he kept me company i had already warned holmes by telegram of the hour of our arrival but we found a message waiting that he was in lewisham and would expect us there that was a surprise but an even greater one was to find that he was not alone in the sitting-room of our client a stern-looking impassive man sat beside him a dark man with grey-tinted glasses and a large masonic pin projecting from his tie this is my friend mr barker said holmes he has been interesting himself also in your business mr josiah amberley though we have been working independently but we both have the same question to ask you mr amberley sat down heavily he sensed impending danger i read it in his straining eyes and his twitching features what is the question mr holmes only this what did you do with the bodies 
the man sprang to his feet with a hoarse scream. He clawed into the air with his bony hands. His mouth was open, and for the instant he looked like some horrible bird of prey. In a flash we got a glimpse of the real Josiah Amberley, a misshapen demon with a soul as distorted as his body. As he fell back into his chair, he clapped his hand to his lips as if to stifle a cough. Holmes sprang at his throat like a tiger and twisted his face towards the ground. A white pellet fell from between his gasping lips. No shortcuts, Josiah Amberley. Things must be done decently and in order. What about it, Barker? I have a cab at the door, said our taciturn companion. It is only a few hundred yards to the station. We will go together. You can stay here, Watson. I shall be back within half an hour. The old colorman had the strength of a lion in that great trunk of his, but he was helpless in the hands of the two experienced manhandlers. Wriggling and twisting, he was dragged to the waiting cab, and I was left to my solitary vigil in the ill-omened house. In less time than he had named, however, Holmes was back, in company with a smart young police inspector. "'I've left Barker to look after the formalities,' said Holmes. "'You had not met Barker, Watson. He is my hated rival upon the Surrey shore. When you said a tall, dark man, it was not difficult for me to complete the picture.' He has several good cases to his credit, has he not, Inspector? He has certainly interfered several times, the Inspector answered with reserve. His methods are irregular, no doubt, like my own. The irregulars are useful sometimes, you know. You, for example, with your compulsory warning about whatever he said being used against him, could never have bluffed this rascal into what is virtually a confession. Perhaps not. But we get there all the same, Mr. Holmes. Don't imagine that we had not formed our own views of this case, and that we would not have laid our hands on our man. You will excuse us for feeling sore when you jump in with methods which we cannot use, and so rob us of the credit. There shall be no such robbery, MacKinnon. I assure you that I efface myself from now onwards. And as to Barker, he has done nothing save what I told him. The inspector seemed considerably relieved. That is very handsome of you, Mr. Holmes. Praise or blame can matter little to you, but it is very different to us when the newspapers begin to ask questions. Quite so. But they are pretty sure to ask questions anyhow, so it would be as well to have answers. What will you say, for example, when the intelligent and enterprising reporter asks you, what the exact points were which aroused your suspicion, and finally gave you a certain conviction as to the real facts. The inspector looked puzzled. We don't seem to have got any real facts yet, Mr. Holmes. You say that the prisoner, in the presence of three witnesses, practically confessed, by trying to commit suicide, that he had murdered his wife and her lover. What other facts have you? Have you arranged for a search? There are three constables on their way. Then you will soon get the clearest fact of all. The bodies cannot be far away. Uh, try the cellars and the garden. It should not take long to dig up the likely places. This house is older than the water pipes. There must be a disused well somewhere. Try your luck there. But how did you know of it, and how was it done? I'll show you first how it was done, and then I will give the explanation which is due to you and even more to my long-suffering friend here, who has been invaluable throughout. But first, I would give you an insight into this man's mentality. It is a very unusual one, so much so that I think his destination is more likely to be broad more than the scaffold. He has, to a high degree, the sort of mind which one associates with the medieval Italian nature rather than with the modern Briton. He was a miserable miser who made his wife so wretched by his niggardly ways that she was a ready prey for any adventurer. Such a one came upon the scene in the person of this chess-playing doctor. Amberley excelled at chess, one Mark Watson of a scheming mind. Like all misers, he was a jealous man, and his jealousy became a frantic mania. Rightly or wrongly, he suspected an intrigue. He determined to have his revenge and he planned it with diabolical cleverness. Come here. 
Holmes led us along the passage with as much certainty as if he had lived in the house, and halted at the open door of the strong-room. Who? What an awful smell of paint! cried the inspector. That was our first clue, said Holmes. You can thank Dr. Watson's observation for that, though he failed to draw the inference. It set my foot upon the trail. Why should this man, at such a time, be filling his house with strong odours? Obviously to cover some other smell which he wished to conceal, some guilty smell which would suggest suspicions. Then came the idea of a room such as you see here with iron door and shutter, a hermetically sealed room. Put those two facts together, and whither do they lead? I could only determine that, by examining the house myself. I was already certain that the case was serious, for I had examined the box-office chart at the Haymarket Theatre, another of Dr. Watson's bull's-eyes, and ascertained that neither B-30 nor 32 of the upper circle had been occupied that night. Therefore, Amberley had not been to the theatre, and his alibi fell to the ground. He made a bad slip when he allowed my astute friend to notice the number of the seat taken for his wife. The question now arose how I might be able to examine the house. I sent an agent to the most impossible village I could think of, and summoned my man to it at such an hour that he could not possibly get back. To prevent any miscarriage, Dr. Watson accompanied him. The good vicar's name I took, of course, out of my Crockford. Do I make it all clear to you? It is masterly, said the inspector, in an awed voice. There being no fear of interruption, I proceeded to burgle the house. Burglary has always been an alternative profession, had I cared to adopt it, and I have little doubt that I should have come to the front. Observe what I found. You see the gas pipe along the skirting here. Very good. It rises in the angle of the wall, and there is a tap here in the corner. The pipe runs out into the strong room, as you can see, and ends in that plaster rose in the centre of the ceiling, where it is concealed by the ornamentation. That end is wide open. At any moment, by turning the outside tap, the room could be flooded with gas. With door and shutter closed, and the tap full on, I would not give two minutes of conscious sensation to anyone shut up in that little chamber. By what devilish device he decoyed them there I do not know, but once inside the door they were at his mercy. The inspector examined the pipe with interest. One of our officers mentioned the smell of gas, said he, but of course the window and door were open then, and the paint, or some of it, was already about. He had begun the work of painting the day before, according to his story. But what next, Mr. Holmes? Well, then came an incident which was rather unexpected to myself. I was slipping through the pantry window in the early dawn when I felt a hand inside my collar, and a voice said, Now, you rascal, what are you doing in there? When I could twist my head round, I looked into the tinted spectacles of my friend and rival, Mr. Barker. It was a curious foregathering, and set us both smiling. It seems that he had been engaged by Dr. Ray Ernest's family to make some investigations, and had come to the same conclusion as to foul play. He had watched the house for some days, and had spotted Dr. Watson as one of the obviously suspicious characters who had called there. He could hardly arrest Watson, but when he saw a man actually climbing out of the pantry window— there came a limit to his restraint. Of course, I told him how matters stood, and we continued the case together. Why him? Why not us? Because it was in my mind to put that little test which answered so admirably. I fear you would not have gone so far. The inspector smiled. Well, maybe not. I understand that I have your word, Mr. Holmes, that you step right out of the case now, and that you turn all your results over to us. Certainly. That is always my custom. Well, in the name of the force, I thank you. It seems a clear case, as you put it, and there can't be much difficulty over the bodies. I'll show you a grim little bit of evidence, said Holmes, and I am sure Amberley himself never observed it. 
You'll get results, Inspector, by always putting yourself in the other fellow's place and thinking what you would do yourself. It takes some imagination, but it pays. Now, we will suppose that you were shut up in this little room, had not two minutes to live, but wanted to get even with the fiend who was probably mocking at you from the other side of the door. What would you do? Write a message. Exactly. You would like to tell people how you died. No use writing on paper. That would be seen. If you wrote on the wall, some eye might rest upon it. Now, look here. Just above the skirting is scribbled with a purple indelible pencil. We w That's all. What do you make of that? Well, it's only a foot above the ground. The poor devil was on the floor and dying when he wrote it. He lost his senses before he could finish. He was writing we were murdered. That's how I read it. If you find an indelible pencil on the body... We look out for it, you may be sure. But those securities. Clearly there was no robbery at all. And yet he did possess those bonds. We verified that. You may be sure he has hidden them in a safe place. When the whole elopement had passed into history, he would suddenly discover them, and announce that the guilty couple had relented and sent back the plunder, or had dropped it on the way. "'You certainly seem to have met every difficulty,' said the inspector. "'Of course he was bound to call us in. But why he should have gone to you I can't understand.' "'Pure swank!' Holmes answered. He felt so clever and so sure of himself that he imagined no one could touch him. He could say to any suspicious neighbor, "'Look at the steps I have taken. I have consulted not only the police, but even Sherlock Holmes.' The inspector laughed. "'We, we must forgive your even, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'It's as workmanlike a job as I can remember.' A couple of days later, my friend tossed across to me a copy of the bi-weekly North Surrey Observer. Under a series of flaming headlines which began The Haven Horror and ended with Brilliant Police Investigation, there was a packed column of print which gave the first consecutive account of the affair. The concluding paragraph is typical of the whole. It ran thus. The remarkable acumen by which Inspector McKinnon has deduced from the smell of paint that some other smell, that of gas, for example, might be concealed. The bold deduction that the strong room might also be the death chamber and the subsequent inquiry which led to the discovery of the bodies in a disused well, cleverly concealed by a dog kennel, should live in the history of crime as a standing example of the intelligence of our professional detectives. "'Well, well, McKinnon is a good fellow,' said Holmes, with a tolerant smile. "'You can file it in our archives, Watson. Some day the true story may be told.'" End of the Adventure of the Retired Colourman End of the Casebook of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle